Hello. Um, nice to, <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to be back. Uh, I feel like I'm getting used to turning up every week, so be careful. Um, I, uh, uh, I think, you know, I, I don't mind doing all the talking, but I actually think after a while I begin to bore myself and I probably begin to bore you too. So I would much rather get into some questions uh, as quickly as possible. But I will start with some of the things I said I was going to talk about last week. Um, and I also have a few questions that uh, have been sent in to me so I can answer those. But I'm also very, very keen to try and get us into a discussion. Um, I saw my video. Thank you all very much. YouTube, you know, 134 views. <laughs> that, that's me going like this 134 times. Uh, so, uh, it's nice to know that I've gone viral, um, and um, uh, it's actually very interesting to, to watch, you know, as, a, as somebody that does quite a lot of speaking, I actually never really sit down and, and watch myself, and I use my hands too much, but, you know, too, too late, I'm still doing it. Um, okay, well, I left off last week, I think, with um, what's a crisis, uh, and then I was going to move into how to deal with a crisis. But before I do that, I think uh, I'd like to spend a couple of moments on the black swans. Uh, as I explained last week, black swans are uh, called black swans because until somebody found one in Australia, it was assumed that all swans were white. And then once uh, a black swan had been found, uh, suddenly the view of what a swan was changed. And the concept is that risk is, is a, as a black swan, that uh, there are risks that are now appearing that really we cannot forecast. You know, you can sit, one of the things you do as a, as a manager, as a CEO, is that you try and imagine all the things that can go right and all the things that can go wrong. I start by saying you have to think of all the things that go right because if you don't think of that, really you're out of business. So it, you, you mustn't approach business as how to avoid risk. I, I mentioned that last week. It, it's about how to take risk and how to take risk profitably. But you also have to prepare for the fact that in life, uh, because you don't control everything that happens to you, you don't control everything that happens to your business, that you have to be prepared uh, for something that's going to happen to you that you can't forecast. Now, you know, if it's the unknown unknown, as it's called, then there's no point in spending a whole bunch of time trying to work out what it's going to be. Because just as you prepare, you think, for the unknown, uh, the unknown unknown will come along and will surprise you. So the concept of a black swan is that it's outside normal expectations. It's something that you can't today imagine. Uh, and one of the ways of describing it is that it's a fat tail. You know, this statistical distribution, there's a certain distribution that occurs, and it's meant to slope off towards the end so that the chances of something happening over here and the impact of something happening over here is low, but this has got a fat tail and means that something's going to happen to you that's going to have a very major impact on your business. And uh, are we having a problem with uh, audiovisual? You, am I not coming through loud and clear? Okay. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Because, um, you know, this is going to go viral. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, now human nature... Uh, doesn't like this environment. Human nature likes to have uh, an environment that is predictable. And uh, this uh, uh, author, Talib Nassim, uh, who's made a fortune out of this, um, divided the world, and I quite like his division, he divided the world into Mediocrestan and Extremistan. Mediocrestan is a world in which things are non-scalable, you know, my lectures are non-scalable unless they go on YouTube. Um, you know, I am, I, here I am and I can actually communicate with you, but I can't communicate more than once with you. And obviously with video that changes it slightly. It has mild randomness, means that sometimes some things happen and other times other things happen. I mean, if you think about a, um, uh, an engine and all the different bits of an engine, sometimes something goes wrong. But it's, it only has a mild impact and it doesn't have a, a significant unexpected impact. Please, come on. Uh, it is something that you can observe and understand immediately based on past experience and it is easy to predict. These are the things that happen in Mediocristan. 
In extremistan, different things happen. First of all, it's scalable. You become famous and you only have to appear once and your image is used a million times. Your ability to take that revenue from the viral uh, video is huge. And once this extreme event occurs, it is scalable. You can be, uh, the way he describes it is you can be a giant or a dwarf. The average height of people in this room would not vary significantly. Uh, if you had a giant in the room or a dwarf in the room, they exist outside the normal uh, distribution pattern. Uh, it's called the tyranny of the accidental. Means that, uh, that when, when something like this happens, it takes complete control over your world. And because it's unforecastable, it takes control in a way that causes you to lose your balance. Because you're not in the normal world, you're outside your, your frame of reference. Uh, and it's determined by a small number of extreme events. We want Media Cristan. Why do we want it? Well, it, it, it prevents things that we don't understand having significant impact on us. Now, obviously, if things that we didn't forecast only had positive impacts on us, that would be fine. But what we're talking about here is events that are unpredictable that will change our life in a very negative way that we can't, um, that we can't prepare for. We can try and create patterns to make things make sense. In this world where things are not extreme, you can create a set of patterns of events that occur and use those as a guide to how you expect the future to be. And we prefer not to have to worry about those black swans. But the role of, uh, of the black swan is that it doesn't necessarily have to have an immediate impact. So a black swan, if you were sitting in 1930, would be a computer. Now, computers didn't suddenly appear you know, overnight and change the world. Uh, actually, if you, uh, has, uh, has anybody seen the, the rooms that c the old computers that used to fit into? Yeah. Has, you know, I mean, they were huge. And actually, a big driver for computer generation or, or to, for the advancement of computers was Bletchley Park in the UK during the war, during the Second World War, that was used to uh, decrypt um, the ciphers of the, of the Nazi uh, army and navy. Um, and th this computer, this, the gradual effect of computers, has occurred over some time. But if you were looking back a generation, the impact is so significant. I mean, when I teach in another university whose name will remain nameless, um, it's like Harry Potter, you know, Voldemort. You can't, can't, you can't name. Well, it's a sort of Russian university. Um, but anyway, so, so they all sit. Now, you see, you're all very polite. You sit here, and you, you seem to be paying some sort of attention. Please, come on in. Yeah, sure. Um, you seem to be, well, at least you're pretending to pay attention. Um, uh, students at this other unnamed university sit there behind their computers that are online. And so if the professor is slightly boring, they just go online. And what happens is, is that actually it's, it's terrifying as a professor or as a lecturer, because as you sit and watch the audience, instead of people sort of not looking at you anymore, they're actually just working away on Facebook or whatever. And, and the second thing that happens is that they fact-checked you. So what happens is that, so for instance, I was talking about risk. And I was saying, you know, my son, who's 13, is ranked number three in America in rock climbing. It's they a, say we're not. We, no, they, what they do is they go, and then they all gather around, and they're watching my son climbing just to, <laughs> to, to check. But the point is that, you, you know, this has inverted the pyramid where the professor is the guy in charge and the students are listening, and the students are the ones that are in charge, and it's the professor who's kind of on his toes. You might want that sort of system for some of your professors, perhaps. But. Uh, but the fact is that that computer has changed the whole way that the learning process goes on. And actually, I mean, it's a longer conversation, but, you know, do you actually need to remember anything? Or do you just have to know how to Google? Um, and, and, you know, if you were studying when I was studying, you know, this concept of how you were going to find information, well, you'd go to the library and you'd spend six hours trying to find an entry that you guys can find in a millisecond. Now, think of all the efficiency that that brings in. And the question, that it, the question that you might ask is, does the efficiency bring, you know, cause laziness? I don't mean that you're lazy, but just the laziness in the process, because you actually don't have to remember anything. How many people can actually, 
I'm talking to a Russian audience. You can probably all do this. How many people can remember poems? You know, I mean, actually, Russians on the whole remember a lot of poems. Because uh, you all went through a... Uh, no, no, well, but everybody needs to have a poem. Have you never sat on a sunny day and wondered what to do? Because, you see, as an Englishman, I look out there and I've got nothing to say. But you guys can, you know, recite uh, Pushkin uh, into the air. It's great. Uh, I used to know um, a couple of poems, and that was it, but they've all gone. So anyway, so, so I think that this business of um, this, the black swan, you shouldn't think of it necessarily as something that occurs uh, in a millisecond and changes everything. It can, can, in a, it can occur over time. But it can be an earthquake. You see, an earthquake, in a way, it's not a black swan. Uh, on one level, an earthquake is an event that occurs in nature that up to a point you can predict. Actually, apparently you can't predict it completely because you don't know where the tectonic shift is going to actually occur. But you know roughly, you know, the San Andreas Fault and everything, which is why it's not a good idea to live in Los Angeles. But, uh, you know, the actual event and when it's going to come isn't predictable. But the event itself is something that has happened in the past, and therefore you have some broad idea of its impact. And back to the, the, the example I gave last week, if you're uh, a 9-11 hijacker with a box cutter, you change people's view of what uh, an airliner does. Um, I guess the bottom line here is, is that you, uh, there's a risk in crossing the road, just don't cross it blindfolded. You know, that you have certain risks that you, you are bound to take. There are other risks that you don't know whether or not you're taking them or not. But you, you should be aware of the environment that you're in. Um, I'm, I hate using slides. I'd much rather just talk. Um, if, if, you, if you want to deal with black swans, if you want to deal with these unpredictable uh, events, the best thing to do is to create a team around you that can react to a whole series of different circumstances. And creating this team in a business environment is about communication, shortening the lines of communication, maximizing the access to relevant information, not maximizing information, because actually in a crisis, you don't want a thousand dials. If you have a thousand dials and you're trying to follow each of them flickering, you're going to miss the three in the bottom right-hand corner that are telling you you've just run out of fuel and the engine's just stopped. So it's much better to create a relevant set of information than all the information that you think you could possibly need. So create the team, create the information, remove your mindset, by which I mean we all like, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, if you're a guy, you shave, you might wash your hair. Um, you do it in a certain order and you don't think about it. It's a habit. And the reason that you do that is so that you don't have to think about it and you can worry about the, the, the essay you didn't write or what you have to do today or whatever it is that's on your mind. But the thing about habits is that they create a comfort zone. And the thing about black swans is that they create a discomfort zone. And so one of the things that you have to do is you prepare your team for the, the arrival of the black swans, which is obviously what we should all be doing at some level now, is... Make your, turn your head around and make yourself comfortable with the uncomfortable. Make yourself willing to understand that the, the paradigm that you're working in today may not be the same as tomorrow. And if you look at what's happening in the West, and we can, and I, you know, I, I do want to get into sort of other things other than just lecturing about risk. But if you look at what's going to happen in the West, you know, it seems pretty inevitable that the the framework that we have operated under for the last 20 or 30 years is about to shift. And as it shifts, different things that we had not focused on before may come to the fore. So turning your head around is a very important part of preparing yourself for the unpredictable. Decisiveness and the ability to cycle decisions quickly it becomes critical as the crisis change, as the crisis moves in. Because one of the things that, well, let, let me tell you, I, and I've been through a lot of crises. One of the, the first things that happen, and it's apparently like, you know, terminal illness, the one of the first things that happens is denial. You just deny that things are getting that way. If you take yourself back to 2008, and as the ruble started to go from 23 to 25 to 27 to 29, you just, 
You know, I was running a bank that was full of young people like you, maybe a little bit older, who had never been through something like that before because they'd been in business less than 10 years, but they were in some positions of significant authority. But they couldn't get their heads around the concept that things weren't just going to get bad, but they were going to get worse. And once they got worse, they were going to get even worse. And it is this ability to understand what the new environment is, not overreact to it. Because, of course, one of the things that... Well, you know, one of the things that happens if you're in this environment and you react too fast is panic. You've got to, you cannot let, the, the thing that will make, the only thing I can be sure about is that if you panic in a crisis, something bad's going to happen to you and your business. Because panic is the loss of control. And the more out of control the environment is, the more in control you need to be. The more that people are, you know, as, uh, I mean, there's some, you see, there's a poem that I can't remember. Um, and it's something like, if you can keep your head while all, st all about you have lost theirs. You know, if you are the calm person in the room, I must look it up so I can repeat it next time. Um, uh, if you're the calm person in the room and you're absorbing the relevant information, reforming your business plan and executing it, you will come out of that crisis ahead of your competition. But the critical thing is to look at the relevant information and decide on a course of action and then execute it. There needs to be, there's a tricky bit here, and it's a good thing it's tricky, otherwise it'd repeat, replace people like me with programs, software programs. The tricky thing is that you have to use judgment to decide at what point you're going to take that additional step, make that change and make it decisively. You can't flip-flop. You can't go into the room one day and say, we're going this way, and then the next day go, oh, just kidding, we're going to go that way. Oh, we're going to go that way. Because if you do that, you're going to be talking to an audience of people that want clear direction. And as a leader, the last thing that you can afford to do is to lose the trust and confidence of your team. So this business of judging when you should make the next move and moving quickly enough is, I'm afraid, judgment and actually experience. Because there's a temptation at the front end to overreact, fire everybody in the office, you know, close down all the, the, the offices and all of these things. That's in the one side. And on the other side, there's the risk that you think, and this is the one I normally come across, that, that actually it's got to get better. It can't be this bad. Things will improve. And then the danger with that is you keep running at the same speed with the same overheads and you fall off a cliff. Um, there's a great guy, Rostix, who owns Rostix. Um, it's, his name isn't really Rostix, but everybody calls him Rostix. Um, uh, who had been through the 98, uh, uh, he'd been through the 98 crisis. He understood exactly what was going on in 2008, and he went to his staff and he asked them to voluntarily reduce their salaries. He said, listen, I can either start firing some of you, or we can all take pay uh, reductions. They took pay reductions. He, he was able to position his business, maintaining capacity, lowering cost, and able to ride the upside when it came. But it took somebody who was smart enough, uh, uh, understood the story, and was um, decisive enough to communicate that to a group of people. Who wants to reduce their salary? Well, if, a third, if, I, if you were given... If I was to tell you, well, here you all are, now I'm going to fire 20% of you, and I'm not going to tell you which 20% it's going to be, or you can all take a 15% salary reduction, you know, then you'd have to think about it. And hopefully you'd act in a logical way. I've got, uh, I've got you know, this would look good if it was on the slides. Um, never let the urgent crowd out the important. Never let the urgent crowd out the important. Think about it. You see, the thing is that, that every day you have 100 things to do, of which maybe 10 are really important. Actually, probably less. Three are really important. And every day it feels good to get things done. You, you know, I always do a... Uh, by the way, well, you know, I love lists. Most uh, action-oriented people like lists. And the thing about a list, apart from being pedantic and annoying, um, is that you can write things down and then you can order them. And you, can't, and you don't lose track of them. And, and, and I, I mean, I you shouldn't... This, there's a whole other s topic, which is how to manage time effectively. So I, I don't think I've asked you this. What is the one thing you won't get again? No, oh, I have asked you this. Have I asked you this? 
Oh, okay, but you're absolutely right. The, I mean, normally I'd like it to sort of, you see, the, the idea is nobody knows the answer, and then you let it go for like five seconds, and then I can say, well, the thing that you won't get again is the five seconds it took you to work out what the thing was that you're not going to get again. Um, so, so, but, so, yeah, you know, you don't get your time over again. And, and the thing about time is you've got to keep a little bit of the time to waste. You know, you've got to waste that time because otherwise there's no quality to life. I'm quite impressed. I'm very impressed, actually, at Ernst & Young because what they do is that they enforce this, this balance of the, the, the work-life balance. I don't mean to say that every day everybody only works five hours, except for me, I only work. But that's not quite true. But the point is that there are a lot of very hard-working people out there in, in uh, Ernst & Young. But they enforce weekends or, or days off where they, where they, they say, OK, now you've, you've worked like crazy, and now it's time to take time off. And I think, you, you know, you're, as I was explaining about careers and how they don't go from point A to point Z in a nice straight line, so your application to how you approach um, work is the same. You, you know, it doesn't require you to spend uh, 16 hours a day every day. There are periods where that might be applicable. But the important thing with time is to, when you're using it, use it effectively. When you're not using it, make sure you waste it. <laughs> you know, don't, don't you know, effectively use time for leisure because that's what it's about, leisure. So, but never let the urgent crown out the important. I'm going to stop for a minute because I said I'm not going to do a lot of lecturing. So now I want some questions and then we can move on to the next subject. Yeah. And you actually did promise to speak about leadership the last time. Yeah. Uh, could you please, uh, uh, you said that uh, if you want to be a leader, you must de develop some qualities and promise to speak about that. Ah, okay. Which is why I've got leadership in crisis as my next topic. <laughs> Um, uh, no, I will promise to get to that. That is my next uh, topic. No, it's okay. Don't worry. I hadn't forgotten. Yeah. Uh, if you were to start a new business in any country that you like, and this business is of your own choice, what would it be and where would it be? Oh, well, great. Say well, you have one, one two hundred thousand dollars. Only two hundred thousand? I'm not going to start much with that. How about buying a Ferrari and driving around a bit? Um, <laughs> Uh, actually, the very good point is that, you, you, well, first of all, it's, no, it's, a, it's a reasonable question, which is which country, you know, what business, which country. But you've also got to put some constraints on it by saying, and this is the amount of capital you've got to, to invest in it. Well, I'll give you two examples of businesses that I wanted to do, which I did do. Uh, in uh, 1981, I was uh, based in Kenya. I, was on, I just moved to Kenya, and I opened a restaurant in Dublin. Uh, which wasn't a very convenient commute. Uh, but, you know, most, most people, most business people at some point want to open a restaurant. Most business people who at some point want to open a restaurant go bankrupt in a year or so. And, and I, I was definitely part of that group. So, um, actually, I was, on the, I was a restaurant on the dockside in Dublin, and uh, I had a partner who was a, came from a very good family, an Anglo-Irish family, which meant that it was a Protestant uh, landowner, um, he's a jolly nice chap, and um, you know he he came from the right family. The only problem was the IRA didn't think he came from the right family, and so every night they would smash up all our cars on the dockside. So after a while, people, uh, you know, and then we got a then we got a guard, and then they smashed up the guard, and, and it, so so that didn't work out very well. And then um, in 2000, I launched uh, a fashion company called the Little Black Dress Company. Um, and the concept being that we would sell. Little black dresses, yes, exactly. Um, and uh, it was, I mean, it's a great idea because, you know, if you have a little black dress, you don't have to worry about stocking colors because you've got one color. Um, and every girl has a little black dress or two in their, in their closet. So, and we own the, the right to the name. The only problem was uh, that we thought we could uh, sell on the internet in 2000, and we should have been doing that 10 years later, but we weren't. So we were ahead of our time. So um, th those are two businesses I'd have liked to have run uh, successfully. <laughs> um, um, I think, you know what I think? I think doing what I'm doing right now is the most uh, enjoyable thing I've done in my business career. So if I can keep this going for a while, that's what I'd like to do. Not so much that I become uh, a fuddy-duddy professor who tells stories about the past, um, uh, just enough 
to keep my hand into this where I can talk meaningfully about the real world and go out back into the real world, but then communicate the stuff I'm communicating. Sorry, yeah. Um, what's your speculation um, on the current financial situation and have you got any trouble in your company and are you trying to react somehow or you're trying not to overreact before kind of to be his downturn? Right, good question. Um, I was asked on Bloomberg uh, in 2009 what the shape of the recovery was. Was it a V? Was it an L? You know, and I said it's a Q. And, you, and there was a big pause, you know, and they were trying to work out what I meant. And what I meant is that I didn't think you could forecast the shape of the recovery. Um, so, uh, of course, I was wrong because it's turned out to be, what is it, a down, then a slight up, and then a down. So we all hope it's going to be a W, I suppose, you know, sort of down, a little bit up. Oh, no, the trouble is it's, it's sort of down, a little bit up, and then a long way down, and then up. So it, it's, an, yeah, it's a crooked W. It's an inebriated W. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I don't, you know, we're not in an economics class. But uh, uh, I think that, the, you know, the key thing, I was on a, a, a session yesterday with the global head of Exxon. And we had a little chat before we all went on stage and I was able to ask him what he thought about the price of energy. Because if there's only one question that you want to have the answer to in Russia, it's what's the energy price over the next two years. Once you've got the answer to that question, you've got an answer to a lot of other questions. Um, and And... Of course, everybody must have read the stuff that Kudrin came out with about how the break-even on the deficit has moved up to 120 uh, per barrel, you know, versus 54, you know, only seven years ago. And, you know, all of this stuff is, is bad. But, of course, you start from such a fiscally strong position with such strong reserves that, yes, you can... And, of course, he's right to um, uh, point out the danger of getting locked into expenses that you then find build and build and build and cannot be sustained if the energy price goes down because that's a very you know if you're offering to pay off the to to pay off pensioners to you know pay the military to do the infrastructure to do uh, diversification and it all happens at the same time that's a pretty big bill and the question is can you afford to do it in an environment that may be threatened to the downside on energy price and uh, I don't think you can. And I think, you know, nobody's going to argue with Kudrin's capacity as a finance minister because for 10 years, you know, he was probably the world's leading finance minister. So when he has a point of view on, you know, uh, w w where we are in fiscal terms, you should listen to him. Um, having said that, I also think that there's going to be this strange situation for at least a year or maybe a year and a half where energy prices are actually going to stay quite strong. And nobody, by the way, this, you know, big warning, health warning, like when you smoke cigarettes, you know, this, uh, this forecast could damage your health. Do not, you know, go out and invest anything on the basis of what I'm about to say, because I just, this is a one man's opinion, and I'm certainly not underwriting uh, this opinion. But it seems that uh, the supply side of this, and the more I talk to people in the energy business, the more I understand that it's not... Um, it is not some sort of science of, you know, you would have thought if all else is equal and demand falls off a cliff, that the price of energy should fall off a cliff just like it did in 2008. But apparently there are sh subtle shifts between the, um, the hedging mechanisms uh, that are in place and the physical deliveries and that these things have actually caused a, quite a tightness in supply. And that that means that actually over the next year it's unlikely that energy is going to see a major fall below 100 now, what's interesting about that is that the commodity prices, you know, the copper and the to economic activity, and there is obviously going to be a problem in the West with economic activity over the coming period. You know, my description actually on stage yesterday, it's like watching a bunch of uh, drivers arguing over the wheel to the school bus as it heads for a cliff. You know, everybody's arguing, all the politicians are arguing, you know, who gets to drive the bus. The trouble is the bus is rolling over the cliff. And, you know, once, once you get to a certain point uh, and you're over the edge of the cliff, it doesn't matter who's driving the bus. Uh, and, you know, this is back to the point that I was making last week, which is risks are, um, risks are chemical, uh, by which I mean that one risk plus another risk creates a third and fourth risk, which are not part of the first two. And that you actually, you, you generate, you can, you can get into an environment where the risks themselves are generating new risks which you haven't, uh, which you couldn't uh, predict. 
And as those risks themselves then run on, so you get into a second and third and fourth generation of development of the situation. Bottom line, um, uh, ooh, ow, ugly. I mean, ugly out there in the West. You know, the, 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 the trouble has been that everybody sort of, including the politicians, wanted tomorrow, today, and borrowed to have it. You know, if you wanted a, you know, when, when I, my, you know, I always try and do this with Alex, my son. You know, you want to take a big, complicated thing and make it simple. It is that greedy people wanted greedy things today that were facilitated by other greedy people. You know, I know, okay, fine, that's not very complicated, but it is because it is essentially the debt burdens of various, it moved from the consumer up into the government and now into fiscal problems at the government level that can't be resolved, other than printing more money that creates inflation or default, which creates a whole series of other problems. And in Russia, uh, you, don't have, you don't have the political instability problem, we all know that. Um, uh, you know, and I'm not, as, as I, you know, this is not a political forum and, you know, I wouldn't get into it. But certainly, you, you know, that what happens next, well, I think we all know what happens next. Uh, the, the question is, can you, can you create the drive for entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, diversification in an environment that has a centralized uh, control to it? And that's complicated. So over time, you know, the commitment to that diversification has to remain in place. Um, and, I, and I said at some other forum today, you know, if you said what's the one most important thing that Russia has to do over the next five years is stay the course on these initiatives, not get lazy or complacent because uh, the economic environment is beneficial, benign, and ensure that, that uh, education in the universities uh, enables a generation, hopefully you guys, of, uh, of people with broad enough concepts, with enough imagination to carry forward these things. Because it's no good being Kirill Dimitrov, who's a mate of mine, with $2 billion to spend and having to find another $2 billion and some debt, $6 billion a year to spend, if you haven't got somebody to spend it on. Uh, and you need, you know, business, as I said last week, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's just a bunch of people making decisions. So you've got to make sure that the people making those decisions have the best uh, chance of making that work possible. Was that an answer? Well, sort of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more questions? Oh, we've got more questions today, yeah. Um, what do you think how Russia will be developing in the nearest future? Some predictions, some... Uh, uh, how will Russia do it, develop? Anybody want to make any add-ons to that question? Just so we get it over with. Uh, I just, uh, I have probably related questions. Uh, how do you think uh, what things or events can become black spots uh, for the global economy and for the regional economies in the nearest future? Just have you ever thought about such black spots or probably that you uh, have thought about? Okay. Um, well, so the first question is Russia and the second question is the world. Um, and the first question is what is the sort of future of development? What are the positive things? And, and then the, the second question is, what are the black swans that could stop that? Um, well, I think in terms of Russian development, you have in place a lot of what you need. You have in place uh, a strong economy. Uh, and relative to the West, you know, uh, you, if you thought you looked strong before, you know, I think over the next period, the period, I'd say that the one thing in terms of development is the danger that you become arrogant with your situation which is driven by energy. I think one of the big things that could be a, you know, could be a problem is that you don't uh, take this opportunity and invest it wisely. And the opportunity is that you have this in, in unusual environment where energy may stay high despite, um, despite the weakening demand in the world. Uh, I think there is an understanding in Russia, pretty much, uh, that there is this need to diversify. And I think that that has been accepted at the highest levels. And therefore, I think that as long as that is maintained, you have some good opportunities. Actually, you know, even down to, you know, my reaction to sports events is to fall asleep, mainly. But I mean, I'm not really a sports fan. But I understand that if you do the Olympics, and more importantly, if you do the football, you have to put in place the infrastructure. And once you put in place the infrastructure, it isn't about the football, it's about the infrastructure. And so if you put 
And of course, why do you have this problem with infrastructure? Well, you had three generations going in the wrong direction. You know, when you have this forced industrialization that sticks plants because they make left shoes in Siberia and they make right shoes in Krasnodar, you know, and there's no sense to how it was done because it was a command and control economy, you know, clearly when you want to revamp that, that isn't something that's going to happen overnight. And as I keep reminding people, 15 years is overnight. You know, you, 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 I mean, or 15 years of banking, uh, uh, the banking environment, or 20 years if you want to be generous, but it's really 15 years. It's, you've only just got started. And so when people, you know, give you a hard time about where your banking institutions are and why hasn't it improved more and blah, blah, the fact is that actually it is incredible how far it's got. Now, a risk that I think that you run is that you may have too much state control and that actually what's happening here is that because of the environment not being benign for privatization, uh, which obviously was on the, scale, it was on the agenda, but you know, nobody's going to go into these equity markets and think they're going to get away at a decent price. I think the danger is, is that the state becomes, or it already has become, a more and more important part of your, of your economy. And state organizations generally are not as efficient, generally, as private organizations. Of course, if you, that, that's coming from an Englishman whose best friend runs a big part of Royal Bank of Scotland, which is a state organization. And why is it a state organization? Because the private organization failed. So, you know, it, it, it's terribly, I mean, it's terribly tempting for foreigners to come here and start talking down to Russians. But they should remember something, which is that the Western scheme of things didn't work. Then the Western banking system didn't work. And actually, for me to start saying that statism isn't, um, isn't an efficient process, I should remember that the banks in my home country went bust to the point where they had to be bailed out. The thing that I would say there is that um, in this, if we just talk about banking, is that you, know, you need the injection of, you constantly need new blood, air-rated new blood. Any environment where you close the door and you keep everybody in the room and people don't uh, come and go and you don't have new product, will over time degenerate. Now, if you look at Sparebank and you look where they are now versus seven years ago, say, they have made incredible pro progress. And they've done it by a chief executive who has the, the, the complete understanding of the need for change and is driving that change, and a team around him who is also driving the change. But nevertheless, you, you know, I wrote a uh, small piece about why foreign banks are important in Russia. You don't, you need foreign banks because you need their access to global product development that brings new product into this marketplace. And it's this business of in, ensuring that there's circulation in the environment that will keep you, f that keep, keep the marketplace fresh, the product innovative, and will keep you, you know, with a service focused mentality. The danger about having uh, a state-controlled entity is that there is the danger that you don't face the same market forces that you do in the private sector. And if you look at banking, the concept there would be that your cost of capital is so low that you can pretty much beat out the competition without very much effort. I'm sorry, I'm sort of rambling a bit here. I mean, I think that um, I think the, the, the quick answer to you, where does Russia lie? You know, Ru Russia, you, uh, yes, I, this is a point that I think may, is worthwhile to make. You need the decisions of your future made inside your borders. You don't need commodity prices to decide whether or not you're successful, and you don't need capital markets, uh, global capital markets, to decide whether you have liquidity. If you can build liquidity in your own borders and you can build an industry, a diversified industry base within your own borders, then you have control over your destiny. If you don't do that, then you will forever be at the whim of whoever's controlling your, your commodity prices and your, and your capital market. So I think that is in terms of developmentally. Talk, hang on a sec. Uh, well, actually, if you want to just pick up on that, yes, directly. Otherwise, I'll answer. Does that mean we should resort to protectionism? No, what it means, no, it's, it's no, 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 you, you can't do that because I understand what you're saying, which is uh, how do you de-link it? You de-link it by bringing onshore capacity, well, by two things. No, if you try and put up a border, all that happens is any time you try and stop something that's happening, that should be happening, all that happens is it will happen eventually and it'll just rip you apart. And so if you try and prevent, you know, you, you build a seawall, well, you know, a tsunami happens and the wall comes down. It isn't, you don't do it that way, you do it the other way. You do it by building your capacity in a diversified industry base 
internally, so you build, your, build away from the GDP dependence on energy, and you build capital markets by creating a longer-term horizon, which, you know, let's not forget, you've got a 7.2% inflation rate now. It's incredible. You've got the right environment now because you've beaten inflation that you can start thinking about long-term onshore ruble capital markets. And if you can do that, you can then you take control not by cutting the lines, but by creating your own marketplace that's able to onshore fund in your own currency long, medium and long-term projects. So it's sort of the opposite of what you say. I'm not saying try and create a barrier to keep everybody out, but build yourself up high enough that everybody isn't in control. Does that... How do you elaborate on this? Okay, well, did I elaborate? <laughs> okay. Um, let's just talk about, because I want to get to the, the, the global black swans. Um, well, you know, what would be a game changer? A war, a major war, not a minor war, a major war. Uh, Iran gets its bomb in the next year. Israel has to deal with it. Um, the Sunnis and Shiites get down to it in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, Israel, who has no, no counterpart in Egypt, now feels more isolated and is therefore more likely to take uh, uh, aggressive action. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a foreign, you know, I'm in, I'm in, in, in Gibo. I mean, you know, you guys should be telling me, not me telling you. Um, you know, this is not my field of, uh, of knowledge, but what I would say is that as you create um, economic, as you create an economic instability, weakness in the world, global instability in, in economics tends to find its way in to combat. Uh, that you, you end up with uh, 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 the need for certain people to take certain action because of the need for, you know, this is this whole, you know, military industrial complex uh, uh, paranoia. But I think there's something to it. And so I think that... Um, if you ask me what, a, what, a, what, a, what, would, what is the thing that could happen that could be a game changer, it would be that the Middle East, which is already extremely volatile, goes from being extremely volatile to out of control, and that it draws in third parties into, frankly, what could be a very messy situation. I'm sure there's other black swans, but of course, you know, the, you can't predict a black swan, otherwise it's not a black swan. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, what would be the wise to a man uh, who uh, took risks, uh, a lot of risks before, uh, and uh, didn't succeed? And what is my advice to a man that took a lot of risks before but didn't succeed? Yes, and he uh, doesn't believe in success. In his own success. Okay, uh, you want to elaborate on that? What? A related question. This, uh, when we are taking risks, are there any limits of taking risks? How can we differ what risks are worth taking and what risks are not worth taking? Oh, this is, I'm sorry, we've moved. We've moved from a, 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 a little lecture on risk to life management here. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's terrific, now I know. Um, everybody lie down and I'll just talk you through it. Um, uh, so let's see now. First of all, to answer, what would you advise somebody that's taken risks and failed? Uh, like I said last week, one of my favorite sayings, it's not how you fall down, it's how you pick yourself up. And, and honestly, uh, an inner faith in yourself and in what you believe in is what will get you through any of that. Uh, now, how do you get that? Well, that's, a, that's about, you know, I'm afraid that's about, uh, that's a longer story and nothing that, there's no easy way to that. There's no, you know, formula that tells you how to believe in yourself, except that um, I think anybody that acknowledges their failures and learns from them, uh, even if the learning is painful, will emerge stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, and, and provided you're, um, provided you're prepared to take that, um, that point of view, then I think that, uh, that you can progress. I think the danger is, and what you have to break out of, is if you get yourself in what I call a negative spiral where you, you know, make a mistake and you think, oh crap, I made a mistake, and then you make another one, and you go, oh now look, I'm just making mistakes. You've got to stop that process. Um, but learn from the mistakes. I can't remember, what was your add-on? Uh, what are the limits of taking this? How oh, um, we well, I think... Whether it's worth taking or not worth well, taking. Well, look, everybody, look, my sister, and this is where if you all had computers, you could check. Um, my sister is uh, a doctor, she's 63 years old. Uh, she uh, is a GP, and she uh, floats around the world on sailing boats uh, nine months of the year. Uh, her idea of a fun night out is to go uh, night diving with sharks. And uh, so she'll send me messages saying, oh, I went night. 
she called me up yesterday to say that she was, last year she was in, um, in Polynesia and some guy had uh, taken her to show her the island. And she said, well, when she opened the newspaper yesterday in England, the guy, the very guy that had shown her around, had in fact turned out to be a cannibal and had eaten the last couple of people that he'd shown around. So, you know, I'm not making this up. Um, uh, it's, there you go. Okay, so, so when you, so this, so what you're saying to me is that basically I can't go viral because nobody will hear a word that I've been saying. No, well, never mind. Um, uh, but anyway, so, you know, I can't make this up. So, so it's, it's, everybody has their own, you know, uh, my idea of having a good time is, you know, a bottle of good wine and watching a film. My sister's idea of a good time is, you know, uh, diving with sharks. Um, um, my son is working his way up from indoor climbing to outdoor climbing, which is not my idea of something I want to ever see. Um, uh, I think you have to, dis it's what's good for you. One of the things you, you can't do is you can't expect people to come to you and tell you your risk tolerance. You know, people can offer you opportunities to, for you, it's like an elastic band. You know, you don't want to stretch it past the point at which it breaks, but you need to stretch it. And I think, you know, everybody needs to find out where their boundaries are, but it doesn't have to be extreme. You know, you, and I don't think you should be forced, and by the way, I mean this also in business, I don't think you should feel that you are forced to take extreme risk for an extreme return. Because there's a perfectly reasonable, you know, point of view in life, which is that actually I don't want to take extreme risk because I don't need extreme return. I think where it breaks down is if you say, well, I don't want to take any risk, but I want an extreme return. Because, you know, that, that isn't going to work for you. You know, if you think you're going to get extreme return by taking no risk, you're wrong. Um, yeah? How can risks and uh, banks also create value within the banks? How do risks... Well, without risk, bank, banks would have no value, so there you go. You know, there's no bank in the world that would make any money at all without taking risk. Uh, so, um, but it's a good question. You know, the first, the first part of that is you, you only generate a return if you take a risk. If you, if you take no risk and you're invested in government bonds, actually, if you're invested in government Greek bonds, you've kind of taken a risk that you didn't think you're taking. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, the, the concept being, if you take no risk, you get a very low return. Now, the thing about black swans is, that w this is what Taleb is, uh, says in his book, um, which, by the way, is called The Black Swan, um, uh, is that you should maximize your exposure to the upside, to the extreme upside, uh, by taking a limited amount of risk which is exposed to that up upside, whilst minimizing your exposure to a maximum downside. What he's trying to say is that you should, you should take positions where, if it happens, you get an enormous upside, and you should average out your risk by taking other positions with a stop loss on the downside. It's a sort of portfolio theory. I mean, the only thing about that portfolio theory is he is arguing to uh, take extreme posi or take positions that are exposed to extreme upside in the event of a, a black swan. So what he's saying is, look, black swans, you can't predict them, but position you, your, your business plan to, to the maximum upside Im impact if something does occur. Yeah. It's a question related to the banking sphere. So we can see a lot of banks, uh, giant banks, literally dying during this recession. We started with Lehman Brothers, and now Dexia in Europe is struggling to survive. So do you think that these problems have been co uh, were caused because of banks' underestimation of all these risks? Or maybe they did everything right, and the real reason are some circumstances beyond their control? Mm. Well, I mean, I don't, think there's a, I don't think there's a generic answer because every bank story has its own, its own uh, set of issues. Um, I certainly think if, if you take a step back and you're sitting in the space station, by the way, if you ever really want to you know, think about things globally, think that you're an, an astronaut you know, floating around the world and you're looking at this from far away and then you try and say, well, what actually went on here? Well, what actually went on here was the risk was mispriced. Clearly, risk was mispriced. And then the, the next question is, why was risk mispriced? And obviously, there is a lot, and you can see it around the world with these protests now, of, of a perspective that says risk was mispriced because the risk return for the individuals managing that risk was mispriced. And that, that actually, back to my point about business is just a set of individuals. You know, if you highly motivate by creating super rewards, 
managers who are responsible for taking strategic risk decisions by offering them excessive compensation in the short term for short term profit, you run the risk that the organizations themselves are basically exposed to um, uh, a disconnect between what is good for the shareholder and what's good for the manager. Um, you know, one of the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental uh, issues that you have to deal with as a uh, manager is to make sure your, your, your risk acceptance tolerance is in line with the shareholder. And what happens is if you create compensation structures that highly motivate short-term profits, then you run the risk that the risk reward equation will be slewed in favor of massive short-term profits and medium-term losses. Uh, and one of the ways that you can deal with it, which obviously people have been trying to battle with, is to try and make sure that, that you have backward-looking compensation schemes and that you actually force people to vest inside uh, uh, stock options that are then run out, out over three to five years and that they don't get access to it if you know, their deals you know, crater. Um, so in these large banks, the, the, the sort of core thing that went wrong is I don't think they were caught unawares because ultimately the banking system, you know, in the, has anybody read The, the, the Big Short by Mar Michael, Michael Lewis? Martin Lewis, Michael Lewis, Michael Lewis. Um, the Big Short is a story of how people made incredible amounts of money not uh, but by shorting the mortgages. Uh, by shorting those people that had these large uh, subprime mortgage positions because, as the author, you know, and he d writes a pretty colorful book, you know, he said when he went to Las Vegas to a con convention and the stripper had three houses because she'd borrowed, uh, you know, on her mortgages, you know, and she had, you know, let's say a non-sustainable lifestyle, you know, once, the, you, once that sort of lack of common sense has occurred, a subprime mor mortgage by itself is very simply somebody trying to get an upfront fee who doesn't care about the, 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 the actual risk of the mortgage. Because these things could not, there was no way that these people could f afford to service the mortgage. And the people um, uh, who generated those mortgages knew that. And then you had, you know, and so you had a bunch of loan originators, and above them you had managers, and above them you had directors, and above them you had the shareholder. And in the short term, this created super profits. But anybody with an ounce of common sense would have understood at ground level that these were nonsensical transactions. So I don't think, it's, I don't think there's an easy out for the bankers. I think the bankers, um, the risk reward uh, equation got out of whack. Yeah. Um, back to the Russian realities a little bit. During your work in the Russian banking sector, have you encountered corruption? Do you think it's as bad a problem as we are led to believe it is? Or is it all that bad? Well, I mean, there's this index where you rank 137 out of 139. I don't know who does that index and how they do it. I wonder if they go to each of the countries and try and bribe someone. <laughs> you, know, you know, when they get to country 137. And it's, um, I mean, it's clearly a problem. It's a generic problem. It's, it's acknowledged by the administration. It's not like I would, I'm here, you know, a lone voice crying, you know, corruption. I mean, I think when you have the president of the country who talks about corruption and the need to remove it, it's pretty evident that it is endemic in the environment. And, of course, the thing about corruption is that it, what, you know, what's wrong with corruption? What's wrong with, you, see, you know, you just have to cut that out of the video and put that on YouTube. What's wrong with corruption? Um, so, so... But what, what's, what's ultimately wrong with corruption? Well, the fact about corruption, the reason why it's wrong is it, it creates inefficiency in the system. It basically makes uh, the normal, back to the risk-reward criteria, it takes the normal risk-reward criteria and turns it on its head. Because actually what corruption does is it removes the profit generation from an adequate risk-reward balance. Because if you pay the money in a corrupt transaction, you get the reward whether or not you're the lowest cost provider. T take a simple example. If you're bidding on a road and you corrupt the official who's making that decision, then the road that you build costs you know, $15 million as opposed to three. Or if the official encourages you. 
Well, you know, it's who goes first, you know, chicken or the egg. You know, I mean, and, and uh, um, I was in, I, one of the crises that I managed was in Italy in 93, and there was something called Tangentopoli, which was when uh, a whole layer of uh, Italian management was thrown in jail because they were s seen to have been uh, corrupting the politicians. Well, of course, you know, somebody might have asked, well, you know, yeah, okay, that was a businessman. W weren't the politicians taking money, but the politicians were in power, so, you know, they didn't go to jail, but the management went to jail. You know, it takes two to tango. Um, uh, and I think, uh, uh, so first, so the first question is, does corruption exist? Yes, it does exist. Um, uh, is, you know, is it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous in that it creates this inefficiency in the environment. Too much uh, um, corruption means that you're no longer pricing. You're back in the sort of communist netherworld where you know there's no relationship between market price and supply, and that you just you know you, there's a whole different reason why various goods and services get sold that has nothing to do with whether the best provider with the best customer service is doing it. So that's really the problem with corruption, and it creates inefficiency in the environment. The other problem with corruption, you know, and then you you, you know, and this is a you know again it's up to you to decide in your own lives, is that it it corrupts. Um, uh, you know, it sounds rather s simple, but the fact is that if you have taken a bribe, you can never not have taken a bribe. Uh, and no matter, you know, there's, a, the old, there's an old saying, which is how long does a dishonest man have to be honest before he's an honest man? And J.P. Morgan was a dishonest man, and he was honest for long enough that certain, eventually he became a blue ribbon name. But then, and the same with the Kennedys. You know, the, the, you know, the, the Kennedys started off as bootleggers. So, you know, it, it isn't that in the history of time, corrupt people have never become, you know, upstanding members of the society. But the point is that you, in each, for each individual, the question is how do you get rid of that stain? And that's your own decision. And separately, that you, you do have, um, and it's fair to say that, that you, uh, societies go through different um, uh, uh, steps. Uh, evolutionary steps. And so if you were trying to set up a bank as I was in 95 in Russia, you know, um, the, the environment that was going on then was hazardous to your health. You know, people were being killed. Um, uh, now nobody's, you know, short of a couple of outliers, but, you know, people don't worry about their physical security. They worry about other things. And so the risk in certain periods it changes. Uh, but in an individual's life, I would make the argument that it, a corruption corrupts. And, um, you know, if, the, if I was to say to you, well, how are you going to manage your business? I would suggest it's better to be less successful and not corrupt. Uh, but, you know, I'm certainly, you know, I'm not some moralistic uh, guy. I'm somebody that lives in the real world, and I understand that you're going to be... I, d I would love to teach an ethics class. I just don't know how I'd do it. Um, you know, because it's complicated. Uh, on one hand, it's complicated. On the other hand, uh, the world is black and white. Um, don't, don't let everybody convince. Don't let anybody convince you that it's actually grey, because most things are black or white. Sorry. Yeah. I have a question speaking about ethics. Um, how did you adapt yourself to the Russian way of uh, behavior, so to say? What do you think the Russian way of behavior is? Uh, well, uh, when you arrived in the Russian um, bank and you found a whole Russian team there, how did you communicate with them? Do you find it difficult or is it because you're a foreigner and they're... Uh... Well, don't forget that by the time I was Rus running a real Russian bank, it was nine years after I'd arrived in Russia. Um, it was 2004. So that by the time I actually had direct you know, CEO responsibility for what was a very Soviet-style bank at the time, I'd already had nine years of getting used to the place. Um, and obviously, there is a learning process that any, anybody would go through to go into that environment. Um, let me just, I'm, I, I'm going to try and avoid certain things that I don't want to talk about. Uh, so, but I, I will say that, you know, in a Russian bank, paper is king. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, this. I, uh, I would try and encourage my, my direct reports to do various things. I'd try and delegate to them. You know, Citibank, after I was this extremely s sort of tough crisis manager, kept sending me on these sort of hugger-tree courses to try and make me a sort of softer, calmer, gentler person. And so I was sort of, you know, electrocuted every time I did something that was, you know, too, too uh, rigid. Well, of course, you get into a Russian bank situation, and actually people want that clarity. They don't actually want you to say, what do we all think? Uh, you know, they actually want the boss to say what the boss wants to say and to give the direction. But 
what I also discovered was that I'd have these verbal you know, briefings, and the, the people that I was briefing would all nod their heads, and nothing would happen. And, and you know, I'd come back a week later, and they'd all be nodding their heads, and still nothing had happened. And, and finally, I got to the point, and actually, my, and I, was getting, I was ranting at my assistant at the time, and I was saying, you know what, I don't understand. Nobody seems to take me seriously. I go out there every week. I ask them to do something. Nothing happens. She said, well, why haven't you written a protocol? And I, well, first of all, I didn't really know what a protocol was. But then, you know, what I discovered was that there was a huge book of protocols, and from one to a thousand of protocols, protocol 1242 slash B slash 82 slash C, you know, from the chairman to, and then there's some poor victim, you know, that you want to do something, and you, you write that, and you put in the protocol number, done, absolutely done, instantly, because they understand the system. And, and so this business of um, how do you make a Russian organization work, well, you have to work from within. If you go into a Russian organization and you impose Western management tools on it, don't expect them necessarily to work because people aren't, you know, it depends on the environment. It depends, you know, I don't think what I just talked about would work in Ernst & Young for a second because Ernst & Young has been grown in a Western environment, an internal environment, and so the management style and the whole way that it's run is completely different from if you take over a Soviet-style organization. But you use the, use the tools from within. Don't try and impose, I mean, it's about the blend. If you can blend uh, Western know-how and Russian reality, then you have quite a powerful uh, set of tools at your, uh, at your disposal. Okay, well, this is good. I like this because much. I, I will get to leadership. Don't worry. Who, who wanted leadership? So, yeah. so I had on the last question. Uh, do you think we are poor entrepreneurs, or do you think we're learning? We're constantly learning. The nation is getting more but smarter and smarter. Or well, that would be this group, would it be getting smarter and smarter? <laughs> no, I understand the point. Yeah. Um, well, I think first of all, no generalization. Okay, so you can't make any generalization about any country, actually. Um, secondly, you come from this academic excellence that I've always said, you know, of the 11 countries I've worked in, this is the one where the raw material, i.e. you, is at the, the highest quality because you have an extremely strong uh, uh, high school system that creates tremendous uh, raw material that goes into the universities and that, you know, creates certain capacity which, frankly, the West has lost. Now, I've got some questions, which is what happens when your current generation of teachers die? Because there is a generation of teachers that grew in an environment, in Soviet environment, who um, have this extremely rigorous approach to, to learning, and they're being replaced over time, I, I guess, by people who have a less rigorous approach. And so how long is it, what is the half-life of your academic excellence? That's one question. The next thing is that you... I mean, I, I can't remember if I told you the story about when I was in Novosibirsk, I was flying across uh, Russia in 96. Citibank had given me a, a plane to go and look at uh, different locations. So I flew, you know, I saw Nemtsov in, um, in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, and I saw, who's the guy, uh, who's the guy in uh, Ekaterinburg who's been there forever? Who's the governor in Ekaterinburg? Anybody know? Oh, you're all fired. Nobody comes from Ekaterinburg. Um, uh, anyway, so um, I saw him, and then I went across to Novosibirsk. And in Novosibirsk, you know, we were meeting the governor, and somebody said something, and I said, well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work that out. And uh, somebody pointed out everybody in the room was a rocket scientist. And, it, and, 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 and you know, because, the, because, you know, that's where you stuck all your industrial military complex because it's a long way from the borders. So you had this, the industrial, the, the industrial military complex created technical excellence. And the question is, what is that technical excellence usable for? And I think certainly, and by the way, given that you're about to spend a lot of money on the military, a big chunk of that will go into the technical uh, development and a big part of that spin-off should be innovation in technology. You don't, you know, so, so actually you can look at the various things that you're doing and one of the things that you're doing is re-equipping your military and doing it presumably trying to, uh, trying to get the head, the, the, the cutting edge of technology and that will create um, spin-offs into uh, uh, innovative technology, which is a good thing. 
Entrepreneurship is a bit more complicated because entrepreneurship requires a certain set of uh, environment. You need uh, the, the rule of law. You know, entrepreneurs don't like the idea that they're going to build a business that somebody can take away from them. So that issue of, you know, rule of law is critical. You also need, uh, um, you need an environment where young people can think outside the box. You know, uh, you are the best hackers in the world for a reason, because, or at least you were in the 90s, because you had a concept which was, if somebody gives us a rule, how do we get around it? Um, and, and so, b baked into the way that you think, when anybody tells you one thing, you think about how, to, how you can, and this was certainly true in the 90s, how, you know, what's the best way of avoiding it? And in fact, I, I even had, a, you know, at one of the banks, I had somebody come up to me and say, could you give us the rules? And I said, well, you know, why? And they said, well, because then we can work out how to avoid them. <laughs> um, so, I, so I think entrepreneurship is, it's a complicated, uh, it's complicated because you, you need, uh, and, and it isn't overnight. You know, you can't, there's no switch that you turn it on and, you know, the entrepreneurial light comes on. The, you, you need time to be able to grow a generation, to let that generation uh, access capital and, and actually access the process of generating entrepreneurship. So I think it's a, that's why I say that it's about um, maintaining your course, you know, not to get uh, diverted by super profits from energy that let you sort of get carried away with the fact that you are a wealthy country. I live near Novi Abad. I, ca I cannot believe, you know, week by week by week, there's, you know, if you park something as stupid as a, as a, as a low, low mark, uh, you know, alpha, you know, you're going to look completely out of place because everything's an Audi, a Porsche, you know, um, and a Mercedes. And, I mean, it really, if you blink, it, it, you, you realize that, you know, you, you're not in the sun and you don't have desert out there, but you are a petrochemical, you're a petro state. And you, the, the amount of money running through the, the streets, you know, is simply a result of, uh, of that. And that's what I mean by complacency. You know, you've got to keep an edge on it. Don't let too many kids out there with Porsches. All of you guys with Porsches, get rid of them. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, 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 does risk management and still risks uh, themselves differ from industry to industry and from, let's say, banking to uh, insurance? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, I, look, there's... The first, yeah, it was... Okay, and I mean, was, your, was yours the question on risk management? Did you ask that question? Somebody did. Somebody asked a question on uh, what is it, different uh, levels, different... With it. Um, first of all, risk management in its broader sense is the CEO's job. Uh, and a CEO that doesn't understand that is in for a nasty surprise. Because, because you can't delegate the broad definition of risk management to somebody else. Because the broad definition of risk management includes all the things I was talking about last week, you know, through reputational, organizational, uh, HR. You know, there isn't a box that's called risk management. So if you start from that perspective, you can say that in all these industries, risk management is the responsibility of the CEO. Once you get into a specific industry, each industry has varying levels of um, the need for risk management. If you're in the oil drilling business, uh, you know, offshore oil drilling business, operating risks and how you create safety environments and what reactions you have to a blowout, all of these things are really very, very high on your list. If you're in a bank, you have those risks. And by the way, uh, I was taught this very early on by a terrible fire in Sao Paulo and Citibank where a lot of people were lost because they hadn't got adequate uh, fire protection in place. Um, so it isn't that if you're in a bank, operating risk doesn't exist. It's just that the, in relative terms, it's not at the top of the list. And then financial risk management in a bank is obviously very much higher. So um, uh, saying, well, what are the, what, does it vary between industries? Yes, it varies. Because you know, in different industries, different risks have different uh, weightings. But uh, um, the actual process of risk management, uh, I think there's a lot of commonality. You know, um, uh, we were talking about last week, you, know, you need to have an inventory of risk. 
And you need to have that inventory as wide as possible. And then you need to create these streams of uh, information, relevant information, that feed into decision makers. And so when I advise people about what architecture, you know, I'm going to do a masterclass on, on strategic risk management at the beginning of December. And I'm going to do it to an audience, I hope, which includes, you know, all sorts of industries. And I think I can have that conversation because it isn't about how you manage a particular risk. It is about how you create an architecture to manage the risks in your business. And so you have to sit down with a white piece of paper and work out, to, before you do anything else, what, are the, um, what is the spectrum of risks that your business faces. And then once you've done that, you have to order those risks into the risks that will, you know, if they occur, there'll be a bump in the road, or if they occur, you're going to lose the car. Um, so you have to then order within the set of risks, which are the risks that you're most uh, vulnerable to. And then having done that, and you now have a priority, now you have a, a ranking list of the risks that you face. And I'm not saying, by the way, here, they're one particular type, because as I say, they vary from industry to industry. You then have to create an architecture where you decide where are the decision makers. First of all, what is the relevant information that you need to manage that risk? And secondly, once you've got that relevant information, where are the decision makers that need to be involved in taking that decision? And this business of who the decision makers are is a very important part of this because the decision maker, if you, if you isolate the decision maker from the other silos, because all businesses have silos in them. There's the IT silo, the legal silo, the HR silo, the financial risk silo. If you don't drill across them and you create a risk management process that only works in that silo, then the danger is that it, it is not connected and that it will manage its set of risks at, to the exclusion of the other risks. And because of what I was saying earlier about risk being a chemical reaction, you have to put fire breaks between the risks by, by ensuring that the right people are in those decision blocks. I don't know if that's an answer. I mean, I, the trouble is I can go on for a long time on it, but I, I think the simple answer is, A, there's no simple answer. <laughs> um, B, uh, you, you need to get a process in place by which you catalog the risks, create the information systems, and decide on the decision takers. And once you have that in place, you have to check that, the, that you have to um, dry run it, where you actually go through the risks and ensure that, because the best way of running a risk is to do a dry run where you say, okay, this risk has occurred, who's involved, and how many people need to get involved in the decision making. Yes? Okay? I mean, not the complete answer, but... Yep. Uh, what journals and newspapers do you read, and what are your favorite companies from the Fortune 500 list? Oh, for God's sake. I'm not answering that. <laughs> I read Beano. Does anybody know what Beano is? You probably don't. It's a comic strip. No, I... I, <laughs> I, uh, I like Dilbert uh, and The Far Side. I also read the FT and The Times and The Herald Tribune and... You know, stuff. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think you need to, um, there's a, there, again, there's this balance between being uh, informed and being over-informed. I think one of the, you know, you have to be able to create filters. And there's all sorts of stuff on the web, which I don't know about, which you can, where you can aggregate um, news flows. And then you can put in your particular interests. I'm wanting to get to leadership. Um, um, but I'm also happy to take any more questions or that we can do a bit of leadership and then, yeah. Can I uh, ask some questions regarding uh, banking? I think we are uh, in having a problem with uh, the situation uh, when the liability of the uh, sale was hatched. And uh, how do you think what is uh, the best composition of board of directors and uh, how effective are uh, state representatives in the board of the bank? Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to get a D on this. Um, how, so how do you manage risk of state representatives, or how effective are they? On, it depends on the director. I mean, it's, you, you can't, again, the danger with a state representative is they may not be motivated. Uh, they may have other agendas. Uh, if you're the state and you re are you represented on a bank board, you may have national priorities that oversee profit priorities. And if you're a state bank, then the return to the shareholder is diluted. Uh, when I say diluted, it, you, you have to bear in mind that you have other priorities that may not be the purely profit 
priority. And that may mean that you may make certain lending decisions and so forth that cause certain things to happen which are not entirely driven in the same way that you would be driven if you were just looking for return on shareholder funds. So I think it comes back to, the issue comes back to, uh, what is the definition of satisfying the shareholder constituent? And if the shareholder is the state, it may not be return on capital. It may be other national uh, issues of national importance. So I, I think it's, it's too difficult a question to get into in... I'm trying to dodge it. And what about the hedging of directors liability or CEO's liability? I think that, that I, frankly, as a director, I would always as, uh, assume that you need, uh, you need uh, to have uh, insurance. In a, in a, in a, as a non-executive director. Um, having said that, I'm in favor of directors being responsible for the actions of their corporation. So, you know, on the one hand, you want to be protected from the enormous downside of a suit, and the company should pay for that. On the other hand, I don't believe that directors can hide behind insurance so that any action that they take is something that has no consequence. They should lose their jobs uh, if they take uh, actions that are not in the interest of the shareholder. Um, I, sorry, I'll just do a quick, how do you judge people? Because I said I was going to answer, and that's the one question that I got that I'd like to, uh, that, I, that I got in uh, written form that I'd like to make sure I answered. Um, okay, so how do you judge people? Reputation. What? Reputation. reputation. How do you get a reputation? How do you find a reputation? Education. Educa hang on, what? Education. How do you judge a person's education? So if they have a degree, a PhD, they're, they're okay, and if they, have a, they, only, they left school early, they're not? Oh, you look at the, see, that's such a Russian answer. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I mean, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, that, that, now, if you talk about things about going into a Russian bank, I mean, I can tell you that I have, a, I have a face that, frankly, I have no control over. So my little face can look happy or sad, irrespective of what I'm really thinking. Um, but what I discovered is if I walked into my office with a sad face on, everybody was petrified. And if I walked into the, my office smiling like crazy, which I can't do, um, uh, you know, everybody was happy. And people in Russia love to watch, to read body language. You guys love it. And, and so actually, you can, if you, once you know that, you can use that. And I mean, I, I have certainly used, I mean, once I understood that, I, I got looked grumpy when I wanted somebody to actually do something. Um, and, uh, and it seemed to work. Uh, but, you know, okay, fine. How people look. By the way, body language, you know, well, I don't know if you've... Body language, eye contact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but, but there's this thing about body language, you know, I think... I, ha I, couldn't write you a, I couldn't write you a textbook on it, but I could say that after 35 years of being in banking situations, uh, or in situations where I've had to take a view on people, I would say that there are people who, who really, you know, don't look comfortable, um, and there are other people who, you know, look comfortable. And there are people who start off looking comfortable who look very uncomfortable when you get on to subjects they don't want to talk about. Um, and there's a whole profession about how you do body language, but it's certainly, you know, it is certainly one of the things that you should pick up. Anything else? How else do you judge people? I've got some ideas. By their reactions, what does that mean? Actions. Actions, ah, yeah. It's not what you do, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Um, and I actually think that that's very true. I think if you want to judge, it's like if you want to judge a, a man, well, a man or a woman, judge their friends. You know, people, people it's, a, it's a, an old saying, but if you want to know who a man is, look at his friends. Because uh, you, you, if you're a man that surrounds himself with, you know, uh, dodgy characters, um, then that probably means that that's your comfort zone. If you surround yourself with people with skills and integrity, that's probably your comfort zone too. People with skills and integrity don't like to hang out with people without those. So actually looking, see that's, and I would say that that, that is something that you can do, which is this business of putting somebody in context. You know, it's very easy for somebody to turn up in your office in a nice suit and look good for an hour. You know, one of the things about uh, an interview is everybody can interview well for an hour. The question is, how do you, get, you know, get through that? Well, I can tell you, I'll give you an example for, for, that occurred to me, was that when I was being interviewed for HSBC, I went through 22 interviews. And, uh, and, and I am pretty sure that they, I never found out, but I'm pretty sure that they circulated a set of questions that they were all going to answer, uh, ask me. 
I mean, they asked other ones, but they were the same questions that I kept getting time and time again. And I'm, I know, because they told me, that they all sat in a room and made a decision later on. And so, you know, they were looking for consistency. And the second thing that they do, did is that they went back 20 years and they asked me for 20 years' worth of references. Because, you see, I could find three people that like me this week, but could I find three people that like me 20 years ago? Uh, and then what they were looking for, again, is people that had dealt with me over a 20-year period who, you know, um, thought I was a good guy. Uh, and so um, uh, a friend of mine once said, it's the, the, the tracks in the snow. You didn't just arrive here. You arrived here with tracks in the snow, and people will look at your tracks in the snow. So if any, any one thing that you do doesn't really matter that much, but you better not keep doing it, <laughs> because people will see where you came from. Any other thoughts? Well, I'll tell you what some of the things. Okay, here's a couple of little tricks for you, okay, in case, in case you find yourself in a situation where you're asked to go and judge someone. Uh, offices, okay? Um, see you, sure. Um, uh, offices. Okay, when you go and visit somebody in their office, what do you think? Uh, th this is something I learned. By the way, I, I went to a course 30 years ago, and they taught me this, and I've always liked this. Uh, it may not have anything to do with reality, but anyway, I found it has some sort of correlation. What do you think the things are that you look for in an office to judge someone? Okay, imagine yourself. You walk through the door. Well, actually, before you walk through the door, you walk towards their office. What's the first thing? What? Hang on, one at a time. Elevator. What's the elevator like? Does it have a TV in it? Is the foyer, does it, is the foyer with a fountain? Inside. Are the people going up with you nice? Yeah, okay, that's all true. That's all, all, you know, be aware of the people coming and going into the elevator. Yeah, I agree with that. In the office, I would look on the table, what stuff is on the table. I okay, think. now you're inside the office, you'd look on the table. What's, okay, what's that going to tell you? What are you looking for? Because people will keep um, different things on the table, yeah. photographs, some yeah, right. stuff, right. papers, yeah, yeah. and you can Easy. make some judgments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, good, okay, fine. So you're looking around, hang on, hang on, one at a time. Uh, we've done, okay, we've got, we're looking for photographs, magazines, stuff lying around. Yeah, what else? Sorry? Um, yeah, sure. Um, by, you can judge also by seeing the order or this order. Of their office. Uh, of their office and of their workplace, actually. Yeah. What are you looking for? Do you think it's a good thing to have order or not? Well, I guess if you want to find the necessary things you want to find, you need to have order at least on the table. Uh, at least on the desk. Yes. You better not come to my office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, walls covered. What's, what's the wall covered in? Oh. Color, color. oh, the color of the wall. Yes, the color of the wall. <laughs> okay. Well, give me an extreme example. What's a really good color and what's a really bad color? Yeah. Yep. The person thinks. Order in the office, how people communicate with each other and how the interaction between them is about. Yep. Yep. You also look at the assistants. The assistants. Are nice girls? Well, how about if they're boys, by the way? Because they. Just, just so that we all, we all understand that you know it's uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry, you had a... uh, I was just going to say about the secretary. Yeah, what are you looking for in a secretary? You don't have to get specific. Um, but what are you? Lo I mean, generally. Well, her being a nice girl, for example, might benefit you and you, the person you're going to visit. Okay. All right. Well, I'll come back to that. Yes. Any more? <laughs> any more? Okay. Sorry. Plants. 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 Yeah. If there are any plants, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, so lots of plants. Orchids. It, <laughs> no, you know, huge expensive plants. No, not a lot of them, not uh, huge, but some. Yes. Okay, let me, let me, uh, let me uh, try and uh, tell you. And listen, this is only one man's opinion, so I, I am only going to give you one, you know, one perspective on it. Um, the first thing I'd say is, is the entrance and the physical infrastructure appropriate to the, uh, the business? So um, I'll give you an example. I went to visit a um, plywood manufacturer in the hills of Kenya. I mean, this was in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Okay, And um, this guy had built um, a huge fish tank. 
you know, in the middle of nowhere. It was a salt water fish tank. They had to truck in the salt water, you know, for his salt water fish tank. It had, you know, beautiful plants, you know, very expensive to maintain in the middle of nowhere in a sawmill factory. Um, we had lent him a lot of money and he wasn't paying us back. And the guy didn't have the, 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 the brights, he didn't have the sense. Uh, that when we actually got out of, we had to take a small plane to get up there. You couldn't drive up there. And, and the guy had in front of the office three Porsche racing cars. And I said, well, what are these things? And he said, well, you know, I bought them for my sons because they're interested in rally driving. And, and of course, you know, the guy hasn't paid us back for a while, and we all knew who had really paid for those cars, and it wasn't him. It was us. So we were busy, you know, as it were. Money is fungible. Money has no owner. So, you know, if the money's got lost, it's because it didn't come back. It's because it went into the Porsches. So, you know, appropriate infrastructure for an appropriate business. If you're a bank, if you're a lawyer, if you're an accountant, you want to create some uh, concept of stability. Uh, so you have to have an office building that's smart, clean, and appropriate. You, you know, obviously there's a sort of, there's a desire in certain Russian banks to kind of go the extra step, and uh, that's okay. Uh, uh, it's when you have this disconnect between an industrial uh, uh, environment and one that is obviously where people spent far too much money on the, on the uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, walking in, uh, there is a sense in a, in a building uh, you can just, it's just one of those things, is there activity, is it dead, is nobody moving? Now, of course, you're not going to see everything, but you can pick up on stuff as you walk in. You know, is there a constant flow of telephones? Is there activity in the office? You know, how much actual uh, sense is there that that's a busy uh, office at work? Walking inside an office... Uh, and I, I agree about the secretaries, except that, you know, honestly, I've had secretaries, little and large, thin and wide, uh, you know, blonde and brunette, and it doesn't, at, at, at the end of the day, what really matters is, is that person, A, presentable, so they're not, you know, so they're, you know, they're, they don't have to be the most, they don't have to be a beauty queen uh, or, uh, you know, beauty man, so just... <laughs> So I'm, I'm an equal opportunity employer. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, they, they have to have, you know, a great way with uh, answering phones. They have to know how to file stuff. They have to know how to do your agenda. They have to know how to set up your, your trips. They have to know how to brief you. They have to know how to organize your office. And those are the sort of things you need around a personal assistant. Inside the office, there are three needs in, a, in an office. This is what I learned 30 years ago. So, you know, let me get away with that. The need for power means that this person has a huge office with a long corridor to get to it, with a huge desk. You know, it's a corner office, and it's all about, look at me, look at me, look at me. That person needs power. Need for affiliation. That person has pictures of the dog and the kids and, you know, uh, and a present from his daughter and everything lying around in the office. And it's very clear that that person has that need for affiliation. And the final person is the person that has a need for achievement, and that person has all his diplomas up on the wall showing what a great, you know, guy is. So, uh, and of course, nobody comes in one particular flavor. So actually, when you walk into offices, people will have a little bit of everything. Uh, the question is, will there be more of one than the other? And the other thing that you can do is you can use it to play, play back to people what they want to hear. If they've got a bunch of stuff around their family, ask them about the family. If they've got a bunch of stuff about affiliation, well, you know, about achievement, you know, ask them about what the things on the wall are. Because actually, they only put them on the wall so that you'd see them. You know, I, I put on my wall uh, my starting salary um, from uh, First National City Bank in 1975. 2,500 pounds a year. And I put it up there to remind myself, you know, how, I was, how well I was doing and, and to point out to people that came in for salary rises that actually, you know, any salary rise was a good rise. Um, so it, it served a, a, a purpose. But, you know, people put different things up and they do it for a reason, so ask them. And in terms of power, well, there's nothing much you can do there except to play to their ego. Powerful people or people that perceive themselves as powerful need to be um, made to feel powerful. Now, I've got a little story I wanted to tell you about. I worked for a very wily guy in Athens in 1984. And this guy was responsible for Citibank's Greek shipping business. And he taught me a lesson about how to get information out of somebody that doesn't want to give it to you. Because you see, uh, you know, pr Greek ship owners don't like, don't like to give out their tonnage. They don't like to give out how many tons of ship capacity they have because then you know, they're worried that the competitors will know and somehow that will work against them. So he'd sit me down, this guy, and he'd tell me the story of how he got to know how big Dimitri's uh, fleet was. 
He said, it's very simple. I took him out for a drink. We sat down. We had a couple of drinks. We talked about his family. And then I said, oh, Dimitri, how many ships do you have? And he went, I'm not telling you. Ah, I said, um, but you know, it's funny because, um, I'm trying to think of another Greek name, Stavros. Stavros, he has 50 boats. Oh, nothing. I have 75 boats. <laughs> and then, you know, and then, and then followed by, well, but Stavros has, you know, 20,000 ton boats. Nothing. I have five boats. And, you know, by playing to the guy's, uh, you know, sense of his own self, he was able to build up a picture of the guy's fleet. And the only point about that story is you don't necessarily have to ask the direct question. If you ask it in a way that causes the other person to answer it, it's just as effective. It can be more effective. Um, and then I just want to say that there's, that, that you know, uh, in crises, people's characteristics come out to the fore. That what actually happens is that you will see some of the things that you see as slight indications in a crisis become caricatures. Uh, I watched a very powerful guy order, we, we done a $2 billion restructuring, we'd taken control of his company, and he was standing in the conference room on the 30th floor ordering people's pizza and taxis because it was the last thing he had control over. And that's actually where he had gotten to. We had removed his control of the company, but by heavens, he was going to, you know, do you want a pepperoni? Do you want a vegetable pizza? And, and this was his last, it was very sad. This was his last, the last, uh, what was left of his ability to control his future. Uh, you don't want to be in that room. Okay, uh, so that's about people. Um, leadership is left. How much time do you want? I, I, listen, I don't want to keep you, so I'm happy for you to leave now, or I can do... Enough, you think? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> some people are voting. <laughs> some people are voting with their feet. <laughs> no, it's okay. You, well, if you come back, it's going to be empty. Um, uh, listen, I. Uh, I. Uh, I just want to thank you all. Um, I would be happy to come back again. Maybe not next week, but uh, you know, whenever it is that you feel like you want to chat. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh, hang on, just a sec. There is one last thing. One last thing. Before you go, I want you, if you're interested, I'm happy to host a, a small group, or group by group of students. Uh, this group, uh, you can basically set up, and I don't know what the, the size will be, but I'm happy to spend some time with a small group of people talking about whatever it is that you want to talk about as in a way of uh, coaching. Um, so now the only way that you get into that group, though, is if you send uh, the organizers uh, the reason why you want to be in that group and what it is that you want to talk about in that group. And um, please do not write more than, you know, 100 words maximum, maybe 200 words. But give me a reason why you want to be in that group and then we'll choose a small group of people. We'll see how it goes. And if it goes well, then we'll roll it out. And the deadline is? Well, the deadline is whenever you want it to be. I don't mind. Um, uh, you know, I will st I'll make a decision in a week. Um, so in a week. Okay, I guess um, that, that's it. Thank you all very much.